All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Google Search Central SEO Office Hours. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I am a search advocate on the search relations team at Google. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts. Uh, where people can join in and ask their questions around Google Search. And hopefully, we can find some answers along the way. Uh, lots of stuff was submitted already on YouTube, so we can go through some of that. But as always, if any of you want to get started with the first question, you're welcome to jump in. Hey, John. Yeah, can I start? Yeah. Sure. Sure. OK, uh, so you might have answered this question in one of the previous meetings, but uh, somehow I missed it. Uh, this is related to core web vitals. Uh, just wanted to ask this uh, this web vital thing is going to uh, impact a website on the domain level or the page level. Uh, like, for example, there is a website with 20 pages with good vital score, and then there are other 20 pages with average to poor score. So, so these poor pages can impact rankings for these good pages also. Um, good question. So the the Chrome uh, user experience report data is available on on different levels. So that's something where depending on the the website, the amount of data that we have available to work with, then we might be able to be more fine grained, or we might just have one score that we need to use across the whole site. And you can see some of that in Search Console uh, directly, where you see kind of like how many pages are grouped together in this, this one data point that you have. OK, so this domain, uh, does it include subdomains also, or subdomain is a separate thing? Um, as, as far as I recall, the uh, crux data is kept on an origin level. Uh, so for, for Chrome, the origin is the host name, which would be kind of on a subdomain and protocol level. So if you have different subdomains, those would be treated separately. Oh, OK, thank you. Sure. All right. Lee, I think you raised your hand. Yeah. Um, this might be a silly question and maybe one that you've covered beforehand. But um, I work with a company that has a very large footprint on the internet. We have over 100 million pages that we're trying to have indexed. And obviously, you know, that's a struggle. Um, but in Google Search Console, um, we have submitted a site map index with over a thousand different sitemaps contained therein. Um, currently in Google Search Console is saying that we have submitted and indexed three million pages. However, when I look at the sitemap coverage, it under that sitemap index, it is only saying that it is indexed 40,000 pages and it's only recognizing one file out of the thousand sitemaps in that sitemap index. So there's some discrepancy there, because that one sitemap that it's recognizing only contains 40,000 files. Um, I, my question is, we have some issues with Google crawling our site and uh, returning server errors, like 500 errors and some soft 404s. Would that contribute to Google stopping crawling or not recognizing our sitemaps because it's getting stalled up somewhere. Like, I, I guess I, I'm just a little bit confused as to where to go from here as far as next steps. Now, I, I, I'm not 100% sure. But I, I suspect in Search Console, maybe you're just seeing a, a part of the picture um, because of the way that uh, the sitemap files within the sitemap index files are, are treated there. So okay. that's something where maybe you're you're just seeing like one of those sitemap files in Search Console, but actually, if you added the sitemap files individually, you could probably see data for the other ones. Got and it. Okay. That's that's more of a reporting thing rather than an indexing thing. So it's right. more that you just don't see the details there. Sure. Um, okay. With regards to crawling in in general, with with a really large website. It's, it sounds like that's the case there. Uh, it is kind of helpful for us to be able to crawl as much as possible. And uh, that kind of flows into the, the general topic of crawl budget. Uh, so there was a, a blog post, I think, 
now maybe three three years back from Gary about crawl budget, uh, kind of going into the different aspects that we take into account there. Okay. And on the one hand, we have kind of the, the crawl demand from our systems, where we think, oh, this is a fantastic site. We need to crawl as much as possible from it. And with a really large website, some, sometimes we, we have mixed signals there. Sometimes it's like, oh, there's a lot of content here, but actually we found it's not as useful, so maybe we don't crawl as much. Right. I, I don't know if that plays a role there. And the other does. side. Yeah. OK. The, the other side is kind of the, the technical aspect that we don't want to cause problems on the server. And uh, that's kind of something where things like server errors flow in, uh, where kind of the, the delay on responses from the server flows in, where if we see when we crawl a certain amount of pages per day that the number of server error goes up, then we'll, we'll back off. And we'll kind of assume, oh, maybe we're crawling too hard and causing these problems. And we want to leave capacity for users, too. So we'll back off a little bit. And Got similar it. with uh, server response time. Uh, so, so the rendering side, kind of the, the speed aspect that most people focus on is usually less critical when it comes to crawling. Mm -hmm. um, but the the response time, like how how quickly does a server respond to requests? Uh, that's something that kind of on a technical level uh, slows us down from crawling. Got it. Okay. Well, thank you for the insight on that. I do appreciate it. Sure. All right, uh, Michael. I think you have your hand raised too. Yeah. So um, I often notice that and it's an established outlet will republish a Wire Stories uh, article, such as Reuters. And then they'll leapfrog and search the original Wire service, whether it's Reuters or Associated Press. And th all those services aren't spammy. They're very trustworthy. What factors would contribute to that happening? Um, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. I, I think. In, in most cases, we, we try to recognize situations where exactly the same article is just being republished, and then to kind of uh, treat that accordingly in search by showing maybe the original or the one that we think where it might have come from. Um, but there, there are lots of cases where we can't really recognize that completely. And then it's, it's sometimes a matter of, well, this content is here, but someone also wrote about the same topic in somewhere else. And then we, we kind of have those, those two viewpoints. Um, so that's something where it's not, I, I don't think there is anything technical or anything specific that is happening there where it's like, well, if it gets republished here, then we just take that one. Uh, but anytime you you have content that is syndicated, it can happen that our systems don't recognize that it's like we should be showing this version instead of the other version. Is there is there any difference between a press release and any other time type of content publishing? It's Not, just content, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Usually, usually it's just content. Um, I I think. To, to some extent, we, we probably try to recognize press releases and understand that these are uh, pieces of content that are just republished in lots of places, and uh, to try to act accordingly for that. But uh, otherwise, it's, it's just content. It's kind of like if I write a blog post or a news article, um, it's essentially a piece of content for us. Right. Now, the nature of press releases is that you, don't, you want it to be somewhere else. I mean, the whole point of releasing a press release is that it goes out into the world where people actually read it. No one goes to Reuters to read <laughs> the news. They go if if there's a new iPhone release, for example, which is always the most popular example. You go to all of the bloggers and tech reviewers and Apple itself to to read that. So it's the very nature of a press release that you you send it out into the world, hoping that people will read it elsewhere. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know if Google News does something slightly different than web search in that regard, though. So that might be something that, that also kind of plays in, in there. Um, I, I know from, I don't know, so, some book about Google a long time back, uh, where in the 
early days of Google News, they definitely tried to recognize a situation where people were writing about the same topic or writing with the same content and trying to understand, like, does that make this topic or this article more important than other topics? But uh, within web search, it's, it's really mostly a matter of the, these are different HTML pages, essentially, and we find content there and we try to index it. John, quick question, just jumping in. First to say hello, long time no see. Um, just while you're talking about syndication, how might geolocation come into that if, if people are syndicating, let's say, an, an English article across different locales, Australia, US, Great Britain? Could there be an impact there with geolocation also on that? I, I suspect that could be the case, yeah. I, I mean, when, when there are situations where we recognize that people are searching for a piece of text that's included in a lot of other articles, then we try to pick like wh which one is, is the most relevant one for the user. And if we recognize that there are some uh, pages or sites that are particularly relevant for users in some locations, then that's something that we might highlight there. Uh, so that could, could also be playing a role there a little bit. And that, I don't know, if something is originally released in the US and a UK uh, news site picks it up, and you're also located in the UK, then maybe you would see the UK news site. All right, uh, Robin. Yes, hello. Um, so we have a bit of a conundrum here. I, I just posted a question in the comments, but I, I don't think you have responded yet. I, I joined seven minutes late, sorry. Um, so we have a big site um, with a global footprint. Uh, and a lot of different English variant um, language sites, which are located in different subdirectories on, on our domain. Um, and we are using self-reference in canonicals and the correct hreflang tags for each of the countries. So we are specifying that the Australian site, for example, is using Australian English. Um, we It is the fact that um, we do have a bit since the, the sites are virtually copies of each other, we are using, using one English language master site uh, and then allowing each country to localize the country as they see fit. But in, in most cases, they don't do that because we have, for example, product pages which are identical uh, in all countries. Um, so we can see in Google Search Console that there are a lot of exceptions due to Google either choosing another uh, canonical than, um, than the one that we have specified. So initially, we thought it was, this would be a huge problem because we would not have any visibility, any local visibility. But I have done some tests where I uh, either try to use an Australian IP to Google on uh, google.com.au, uh, and I still, and, and the same for the American uh, site, and I still like get the US sites for, for pages which shouldn't be indexed. Uh, so, so the page isn't indexed, ac indexed according to Search Console, but it still is the URL in uh, in Google Search, um, which is a bit strange. <laughs> uh, so, my, my question is basically twofold: is is there any way we can get around uh, so we could have our pages indexed without uh, Google Search Console complaining too much, even though the, the sites are technically duplicates? Uh, and uh, if we can't do that is how is Google evaluating the uh, the ranking? Because we, I think that, I mean, some some domains will have more links, for example, external links to uh, the, the American site is much bigger than the Philippine site, for example. And, and so the American site would have much more links to it. If that page is not indexed, but the Philippines uh, page is the one that is indexed, I see a, uh, my theory is that the Thil Philippine version would have a lower lower Google rank, even though, uh, but it's the one that's the template uh, for for our rank in the so on the search results page, even though it displays the American page. Yeah. I, I, I think this is like a, a super complicated topic. And uh, we, we make it extra complicated, I think, in Search Console, uh, unfortunately. So uh, it, it makes it. I don't know, it's super confusing. So basically, what, what is happening is we're recognizing that 
like I, I don't know your site, so I don't know 100% sure if this is actually the case. But usually, this is, is what happens. Uh, we recognize that the, the content is the same. Uh, so you have the same English language content, maybe for, for, I don't know, Australia, New Zealand, or something like that. And our systems will then understand that these are duplicates, put them into one cluster, and then we will pick one canonical URL to use for indexing for that. Uh, we do pick up the hreflang annotations on these pages, so we understand the, the connections between the URLs, um, but we, we still index them as one canonical URL. And in the search results, when you search, if we understand the, the hreflangs properly, then we will show the appropriate local URL in the search results, uh, but we will base it on the can canonical index version. So in the snippet, you might see kind of signs that, oh, this is that canonical version, but the URL should be the right one. And the ranking should be based on whatever for that local URL should be relevant. So it's not, not the case that we would pick, like, like if we had the, the Philippine version as canonical and all the links go to the US version, then we when we put them into a cluster for canonicalization, then essentially, like whoever is shown gets those links. So it's not that those get lost. Uh, but the, the tricky part is, in Search Console, we report on the canonical URLs for the most part. Uh, so in both the index coverage report and in the performance report, uh, we will simplify things for you and show the canonical URL. So uh, if in Australia, like. Well, take, for example, the situation where you have the Philippine in the US site, and we pick the Philippine version as canonical for whatever reason. In the US, you would probably still see the US URL if we understand hreflang properly. Uh, but in Search Console, we would report that as being the Philippine URL. Uh, so in the performance report, it will say, like, oh, the Philippine URL is like very popular. And you look at the details in Search Console, and it'll say it's popular in all of these countries. Uh, where it's it's kind of the, the same content that's being shown, just with the local country versions. And similar in the uh, index coverage report, uh, we'll focus on the canonical URL. So if you have, uh, say, a separate subdirectory for US, then it would look like maybe the US version is not getting indexed at all, but the Philippine version is getting indexed. And uh, that can be very confusing. Uh, but essentially, from, from a ranking point of view, that should be working out. So if we understand the hreflang, we'll show the right version. It'll rank accordingly in, in Search. It's just everything with Search Console, with the tracking there, is super complicated. Um, we, we see this a lot more in, in Europe with German language content, where the, the German language countries are right next to each other. And uh, in Switzerland, we have different currencies, and we can't kind of import things from Europe, all of those weird uh, extra situations. And still, we, we kind of have that canonical issue there as well. So it's not, not just specific to, to English things there. Um, I, I don't see this changing in Search Console in the near future. So uh, that's kind of something where you have to keep that in mind and understand that for your content, one version is being chosen as canonical. And the reports that you see in Search Console, you kind of have to pick them apart and try to understand them on your own. Uh, to avoid that, the only thing you can really do is make sure that these pages are not recognized as duplicates which would be to make sure that they're really significantly localized, which if, if it's an e-commerce site and you have the same product across like all of these different country versions, that's probably not, not that feasible. Uh, if it's mostly content uh, that you have there and it's not a lot of pages, then maybe that is something that you could be doing. So that's, those are kind of the, the options there. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think the, the our worst worry was that uh, our our uh, ranking was negatively impacted. Um, but I, I did find that one of my UK colleagues sent me a couple of URLs uh, for changing, and I think he googled it <laughs> because he did not did not send the UK versions. He sent me the Philippine versions. That's why that's why I used that as an example. Um, is there any way to help Google even more beyond the href lang tag to uh, understand that these are really localized pages? Not really, not really. I, I think also with hreflang, especially if you have a lot of different country versions, then it is something that sometimes we pick it up properly, and sometimes we struggle with it. Uh, so that's something where anyone who's, I don't know, worked on bigger international sites, you'll see that lots of hreflang gets picked up and used, and then some parts just like Google gets confused and shows the wrong version. Yeah, I think we have like 30 English versions and 10 or so Spanish. No, even more Spanish. Yeah. Uh, 15 versions or something like that. Spanish. Yeah. I mean, w one thing that I usually recommend is to assume that users might be going to the wrong version on your site and to try to catch them on your site as well. So yeah. show something like a banner on top, and it's like, hey, it looks like you're from the UK. Do you want the UK version? And make it so that they can get there fairly quickly. OK, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we, we've uh, thought of that, but we, we wanted to, uh, to know if, if our ranking foremost was negatively impacted before we, we did that type of action. OK, okay thank you very much, very much. Sure. Um, let me run through some of the submitted questions, and I'll get back to, to everyone who's raising hands as well later on. Don't worry. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm working on the biggest mom advice site in our country, which was demoted uh, with a core update. They have a great brand, search, and a community of loyal returning users. So my approach is going through the content uh, that is deemed the most relevant in Google for queries from Search Console and making sure that when users come, the content is the highest quality content, solves the need behind the query, and is trustworthy. Is that the right approach? I, I think, in general, that's, that's a great approach, and uh, that's Especially when you have a larger website, you can't do everything at the same time. But focusing on the parts that are seen as the most relevant for your website, that are kind of the, the most important gateways kind of to your content, uh, I think that that always makes sense. So that seems, seems like a good approach. Uh, there are various people within the SEO community who have kind of focused on the, the whole topic of EAT, expertise, authority, trustworthiness. Uh, and they've written lot, lots of really interesting blog posts and case studies. So I would also go through a lot of that just to make sure that you're not missing anything obvious that might be relevant for your site as well. Um, core Web Vitals and subdomains, I think we talked about that briefly. The Chrome user experience report data is based on kind of the browser origin, which is the, the host name. So it would be separate for a subdomain. Um, how long does it usually take to show a web story in Discover after creating it? Um, the, the answer is it depends, um, unfortunately. So it's something where so sometimes we can pick up content very quickly after it was created and uh, crawl it very quickly, index it very quickly. Uh, sometimes all of that takes a lot longer. And Discover, in particular, is yet another level on top of that, because for Discover, we want to make sure that we're actually recommending something that is uh, really appropriate for users, because users are not searching for something specifically. So we have to be kind of almost extra careful with regards to the content uh, that we show in Discover. Uh, so there, in particular, it can happen that it takes a little bit longer for it to start showing up in Discover. It can also happen that it is never shown in Discover. So it's not the case that all web stories are shown in Discover. Uh, what would be the difference between the new passage index, passage ranking algorithm, and the current featured snippet? Um, from my understanding, is the kind of the UI part of this is completely separate from from the ranking aspect. There, uh, when it comes to passage ranking, it's more a matter of us going into the content and uh, recognizing that this page is relevant for something that is kind of hidden away on the bottom of the page, and then how we display it in the search results is completely different question. Uh, 
Uh, so it's not that the featured snippet or longer snippet or anything like that would be uh, tied to the way that we do ranking for those pages. What's the best practice of guest posting? And is it recommended by Google? Oh my gosh. OK. Um, so from, from our point of view, it's, it's fine to go off and promote your content on, on other people's sites. So if you're creating content and you're publishing it uh, on other sites to kind of draw awareness to your website, to what you're working on, that's perfectly fine. Uh, it's just the links within these guest posts should be no followed because essentially you're placing those links on other people's sites. Uh, so from our point of view, that's something where you're putting these links on other people's sites. So that those links should not be passing any page rank. And uh, that's essentially the, the main aspect there. So going off and creating something to draw awareness for what you're working on, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure that the links don't pass any page rank. Uh, if we get links from a subdomain, will they count as PBN backlinks? Um, no, not necessarily. So PBNs are private blog networks, which is kind of a technique that, uh, I don't know, some people, usually spammers, use to try to create a network of sites that looks natural, that all tend to link to something that you care about. Uh, with the hope that when Google runs across this, it thinks, oh, so many people are recommending this page. We should show it higher in the search results. And uh, obviously, if you're creating these sites and you're just putting links there, we would see that as, as web spam, uh, or at least as, as links that are unnatural and try to discount, discount those. So uh, from our point of view, Links from subdomains are perfectly fine. It's not that we would see subdomains as a private blog network. Sometimes sites use subdomains. www is a subdomain, technically. And uh, PBN backlinks are essentially something completely separate, where if we understand that this is a part of a private blog network, then we would just discount that by default. And it doesn't matter if it's on a subdomain or on a main domain or anything like that. So those are kind of completely separate things. Um, just to make it clear, I would not recommend using private blog networks to promote your website, because that's uh, essentially against our webmaster guidelines. Um, what matters the most, the number of unique referral backlink domains or the total number of backlinks? Uh, so I don't think we differentiate like that in our system. So from my point of view, I. I would tend not to focus on kind of the, the total number of links to your site or the, the total number of domain links to your website, because we look at links very, uh, in, a, in a very different way. And we try to understand what is relevant for a website, how, how much should we weigh these individual links. And the total number doesn't matter at all, because you can go off and create millions of links across millions of websites if you wanted to, and we could just ignore them. Or there could be one really good link from one website out there that is, for us, a like really important sign that we should tr treat this website uh, as something that is relevant because it has that one link. I don't know, maybe from like a big news site's homepage, for example. So the total number essentially is, is completely irrelevant. Uh, do you ever consider content published across various websites sourced from the same press release as duplicate content across those sites? Uh, we talked a bit about that in the beginning. Um, technically, if you're duplicating content, then that is duplicated content. Uh, we don't uh, penalize duplicate content uh, in, in our algorithms. It's just that we would try to pick one version and show that appropriately. Uh, and the, the other things that we talked about with syndicated content are kind of in the beginning if you want to watch that on the recording. Um, my home page outranks my internal pages. How can I fix it? Um, it's not necessarily something that you need to fix. So this is something that uh, just happens sometimes. Sometimes internal pages rank higher than the home pages, and people complain about that. Uh, but essentially, for individual queries, we try to recognize what is the most relevant result from within your website or across the web. And we try to show that appropriately in the search results. And sometimes that's your home page. 
sometimes that's a product page, might be a category page, might be a blog post on your site about a specific product. Uh, from our point of view, that's not something that we would consider something wrong. Uh, the thing that you can do a little bit, though, within your website is to help us understand which parts of your website you consider to be the most important. And uh, the best way to do that is with internal linking. So the clearer you can make it to us that this is something that is really important within your website by showing it to users more frequently, having kind of visible links uh, to that content within your website, uh, the clearer we can understand that this is probably something that you care about and that you want to treat with a little bit more weight. Uh, so for example, if you have uh, a lot of products on your website and there's one product that you really care about, because maybe it's, it's the, the product that you're most proud of or it's the product where you earn the most money from or whatever reasons, um, if you have all of your products linked in the same way within your website, that you have different categories and subcategories, and then it links to the products, then from our point of view, we can't really tell that this is a really important product, because it's just one out of a 1,000 other ones that you have on your site. Uh, whereas if you were to go forward, forward and specifically link to that product from your home page, for example, from other important pages within your website, then it's a lot easier for us to recognize that, oh, like this one particular product is so much more important for this website than all of these thousands of other products that are on the website. And uh, that way, you can kind of guide Google to understanding your website and what you consider to be relevant a little bit better. Uh, we have a website uh, that we found many spammy sites uh, pointing to in the link section. Is it worth disavowing those domains? Uh, we don't have any manual actions in Search Console. And we think those bad sites are dragging down our traffic. Uh, so in, in general, in cases like this, you don't need to disavow those links. Uh, our systems are really good at understanding which links are relevant and which links we can completely ignore. And there are lots of levels in between. Um, but uh, essentially, random spammy links pointing to a website is super common. It's something that uh, happens to pretty much every website out there. And uh, our systems have, I don't know, tens of years of experience with dealing with that and ignoring a lot of that. So I, offhand, I, I would not worry about this. If, if you're seriously worried that these might not be getting picked up properly by Google systems, and you really, really want to make sure that they don't cause any problems, then go ahead and drop them in the disavow file. Uh, the disavow file is something we see more as a, as a technical thing. Uh, it's something we look at and we say, oh, you don't want these links? Then fine, we will take them out. It's not something that we would count against your website. It's not something where we would say, oh, this person must have been a spammer because they're trying to disavow all of these links now. Uh, it's, it's really just a clean sign for us. Like, you don't want those links counted, and so we won't count those. So uh, if you're really, really worried about these links and you're losing sleep and you're kind of wondering, is it affecting our rankings, then just drop those domains in the disavow file and move on. Uh, then you're really, really sure that our systems are ignored. For the most part, I think sites don't need to do anything there. Uh, if you've had a site on the internet for a while, then you'll see all of these weird links to your site. And you can assume that Google is pretty good at seeing that, too. Uh, during the December update, we had a ranking drop to our game site. Uh, this is very surprising, as in my opinion, we have one of the best and most complete experiences for this type of site. Uh, while other sites offer mainly questions for the game, we do that as well as uh, show votes for question. And we even have uh, country-specific data. Um, my question is, was this drop due to something technical, such as site speed or hosting? Or are we somehow not satisfying users as well as other sites? Or was it a mistake? Um, I don't know. Like the, the last part, uh, was it a mistake? I, I tend to assume that uh, the, these kind of changes are not mistakes, but they can happen. Uh, so 
if, if you're really kind of super sure that you've checked everything and you think you, you've kind of gone through everything with regards to your website, uh, then you're, what, what I would recommend doing first off is posting in the Webmaster Help Forum and getting some input from other people there. And uh, the folks in the, the forums can also escalate that to Googlers as well. Uh, so if there's something really, really weird happening, then it's theoretically possible that there's a mistake on our side. I, I think it's super, super rare. It's extremely rare that I, I run across something where when I send it off to the engineering team, they're like, oh, so, something weird is happening that we have to fix. But it's, it's theoretically possible. Uh, that said, my assumption would be that it's really more tied to other parts of your content, other parts of your website, and trying to understand like how we should be showing those the, that content more. Uh, so site speed, I suspect, is less of an issue. Uh, in particular, the, the Core Web Vitals are something that we'll start using in May. So that wouldn't be affecting your site now. Uh, it might be that there's some crawling issues if you have a really large website with regards to speed. Uh, but it sounds like if your site has been around for a longer time, then probably we have indexed the, the appropriate content for your site already. So that's less of an issue. So my assumption would be more in the direction of the, the content and the way you're providing that content for users. Uh, I, I took a look at a handful of pages from your website, and I could see how our algorithms might be a little bit confused with regards to how we should be showing this site in search, um, in, in particular because on a lot of these pages, there isn't a lot of content there. Uh, so that's something where if I, if I go to random pages on your site, I'll have kind of that, that card in the center. And essentially, everything else will be ads. And I could imagine that our systems struggle a little bit with understanding what what should this page be relevant for? Uh, so that's something where maybe uh, it's worthwhile to, to kind of rethink a little bit how you want to be found in search and how you can put your best foot forward when it comes to being found in search. Uh, one, one thing might be to think about, like, do you actually need all of these individual pages indexed? Or should you have something more about the content overall itself as an index thing? So maybe less focusing on individual pages, uh, like which, which just have like one or two questions on them, and focusing more on, I don't know, a category of items where you have more actual content on a page. Um, how does Google judge to show more images in the search results in a single blog post? Um, I don't think we have anything specific in, in that regard. Uh, sometimes we can pick up images through structured data, and we can show those in the search results. Uh, but essentially, the algorithms that we have for showing kind of the thumbnails within the individual search results entries are things that are, are more, t I don't know, broader algorithms in terms of us recognizing their multiple images on a page and kind of making the assumption that maybe these multiple images on a page are particularly useful or relevant for users to understand why your pages are relevant for the user now in the search results. Um, so that's kind of the direction I would head there. I think there's uh, there are two or three types of structured data that are slightly different in that regard, in that you can provide a carousel of images or par carousel of pieces of content. I think something like uh, the, the how-to uh, structured data falls into that category, and maybe something around recipes. I'm not, not quite sure. Um, but all of that should be documented in our developer's guide. And uh, you can kind of look at that to see is there something specific that you could be doing. Uh, my recommendation would be to look into the search results of what, what your site is focusing on, and then based on that, to try to work backwards. Like, Is there a specific type of structured data that these people are using, or is this just Google's algorithms trying to be helpful and just show more images? Um, cool. OK. 
I think maybe we'll just switch back a little bit uh, to questions from you all, uh, since there seem to be more and more hands being raised. Um, not quite sure where we were. Rob, were, were you next? Uh, it says Lee was, but I don't know if or he's Lee. already been. But um, I just want to ask about 404 errors in Search Console, uh, or 400 errors in general. Are they, are they still a thing? Because um, I only see uh, 500s and no 400s, despite having lots of 404s. Are they still reported, or are they moved to some other section? Good question. I, d I don't know offhand. Yeah. Um, we, we used to have the crawl errors report, but I, mm -hmm. I think I think it, some of that was the, moved. Yeah. It's in the excluded, I think. You can you can find them in the excluded. Oh, uh, OK. So they're, they're not errors anymore. They're excluded instead. Oh, OK. They're in the index coverage report in that case. Yeah. OK. But, yeah. but can you oh. s then drill down and see them? Uh, yeah, if I, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm actually in that report right now because uh, I had to pick out one before. Uh, so, so you can um, you can click on the 404 post in the it's like coverage uh, yes, and excluded. Right. Click on the yeah. 404 and, and then you can drill down. Yeah, it's just a change of view. It. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, okay. John <laughs> slash Robin. <laughs> cool. Thanks. You you always start with an I don't know anyway as a disclaimer. Uh, <laughs> I. I, I think, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, like these, these changes in Search Console, it's, it's sometimes hard to keep up. Uh, that's, that's why we have Daniel on the team working directly with Search Console. And I'm like, oh, right. yeah. OK. So many things. That's all for me. Cool. Uh, Thanks. Rita? Uh, hi. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, first, um, <clears throat> I have a question about uh, like these pages that uh, don't have actual content on them, uh, and it doesn't make sense to put directly put content on them, like um, online tools, uh, online calculators, online translator. Uh, they don't actually have content. How do we optimize uh, those pages uh, for Google? Um, I don't know. We should um, write blog posts and link to them, or uh, well. sure. Yeah, I, I mean the from 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 our point of view, we don't have a a kind of a system that uses online tools and tries to see what they're useful for. So if you have a calculator on your site. Uh, our systems will go and just see, oh, the number 0 through 9, and some symbols are on this website. We don't necessarily know that it's a calculator. So anything that you can do to make it easier for us to understand what this page is for, that helps us. So that's something like using clean titles and headings on the page, having some informational text on the page itself is really useful. Uh, if you have a, a blog where you can write about these tools, that's, that's obviously also useful, uh, because then we understand a little bit the context of those tools a little bit better. So essentially, anything that you can do to bring more textual information to those tools, that helps us. Uh, in particular, if these are tools where uh, you, you have some functionality that we just don't see because Googlebot doesn't interact with the tool. So if you have something like a map, and you can click on different locations, and you can see opening hours for uh, different, I don't know, businesses that, that you're working with, Googlebot is not going to click on the map and see what happens, uh, but rather we need to be able to find that information in some textual format mm -hmm. in another way. So uh, either having more general information on a page in a case like that would help, like these are the opening hours of our different branches, or even listing that information directly on the page itself, that also helps us. So, if it's if it's like a lookup of the opening hours, then maybe just list the addresses along with the map on the page, so that users can click on the map if they feel more comfortable with the map, or they can scroll through the list to find that information. Uh, so essentially, when when you have these kind of online tools, anything that makes it easier for us to understand what we should be showing this page for, that's useful. Mm. Uh, thank you. And the second question is, uh, 
we had a big news website uh, uh, and on December update we lost uh, like 50% of the traffic uh, and mostly the uh, discover part uh, it completely uh, like suddenly got gone away uh, and we we couldn't find out the issue uh, can you please explain more more about that um yeah, I, I don't know. That's that's kind of tricky. Uh, in so I, I guess on tricky on multiple levels in, in there because I I suspect your point you're talking about the the core update that happened in December. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so so with the the core updates, it's not so much that we're flagging problems within a website and saying we we think this website is bad or has a problem. Uh, but more that we're trying to understand the relevance of these pages a little bit better. And uh, the relevance is something that is, is tied to so many different factors. And uh, that's essentially what, what we try to pick up with the core updates. And the information from the core updates is also used in other parts of search, in particular in Discover as well. And uh, because of that, it can also happen that uh, maybe a change is kind of subtle in search in general, but has a stronger effect in Discover, just because we're a little bit more critical in on the Discover side. Uh, with regards to kind of improving the situation there, we, we have a blog post about core updates that has a little bit more background information on the kind of things we, we look for when we try to understand relevance. I would definitely go through that. It also has a little bit of information on how things work with regards to uh, recovering after making changes within your website. Um, because from, from our point of view, it's not the case that a website is doing something wrong that it has to fix when it comes to core updates. But obviously, you want to have similar traffic as before. Uh, so improving your website overall, that will help us to better understand how, how the, the relevance is kind of better than before uh, for your website. Uh, so unfortunately, there is no one simple thing to focus on there. There are lots of small things that kind of add up. And a lot of that is listed in the, the blog post as well. OK, thank you. Sure. And uh, Feroz, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name, name properly. Yeah. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, actually, I have a question. Uh, one of our clients, we are working for him. Uh, I'm, I apologize for my English. It is very weak. So please don't mind. Yeah, so the issue is that a uh, few of the competitors, they have uh, uh, read some kind of reviews on other websites. So the problem that we are facing right now is that our ORM is not maintained as it was before. Uh, so what we did is we asked the website that were uh, showing up the reviews in Google. Uh, but ultimately, the result is that they are asking for $2,000 to remove those reviews. So I'm not sure that what exactly should we do. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what what the the best approach is there. I mean, that's that's something we we sometimes hear about as well. Um, I I think the most straightforward approach is either to find find some kind of a solution there in regards to kind of having that content removed. If that's something where you think for legal reasons. Uh, they're, they're publishing things that are not correct, then that might be an approach that you could take there. Uh, the other approach, in general, with regards to reputation online is to make sure that the more relevant content is also visible in the search results, uh, which could be something from your side that, that you provide there. Um, so that, that might be an option there. Uh, if this is something where it looks like there is a, a really big scheme in play with regards to, to this kind of content. And that might be something that we, we can pass on to the team here to, to kind of take a look at and to understand a little bit better. But uh, I would see that more as kind of a long-term 
uh, long-term approach. Uh, so for, for things like that, I would recommend also maybe posting in the Webmaster Help Forum so that other people can take a look and give you some tips there. I don't think there is one simple answer that you can use in, in these kind of cases. And it's similar with other situations where maybe there is a legitimate negative review out there where you can't just force people to remove negative reviews. Um, but in, in the Webmaster Help Forum, you'll probably get some input on, on some options that you can do there. Maybe you'll also get some, I don't know, more straightforward feedback on how, well, maybe you should just be providing a better service or whatever. Uh, but I think this kind of direct and, I don't know, more, more or less honest feedback is sometimes very useful uh, to understand, well, what is the general perception externally with regards to this type of issue? And is it something that I can resolve on my own? Or is it something I need help with from other people? Or do I need to kind of rethink what I'm doing uh, with regards to how you're active online? That might be something that also comes into play there. And as I mentioned in the other uh, questions before, the folks active in the help forums can also escalate these issues to Googlers. So if they see something that comes up again and again in the forums uh, from, from the same sites that are doing similar schemes kind of thing, then they do pass that on to the team here. And uh, we do try to take a look at that. It's, it's sometimes tricky with regards to what we can do in cases like that, uh, in particular if, if the website is not spammy. If it's a normal website that we wouldn't remove for web spam, then there's no kind of web spam policy reason for us to remove it. Uh, there might not be other policy reasons for us to remove it either. Uh, sometimes it's, it's really quite complicated. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think. Take, taking the step and getting more input from other people might might be a good first step. Uh, thank you so much, John. I have one more question. That is, uh, can I please? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, basically, one of our page was not indexing. I don't know the exact reason what what uh, what it was. So what we did is uh, we started Google Ads for that page, and besides this, we started social sharing. We started to share this on Facebook and uh, other platforms. Now, I'm not sure what was the exact reason, but uh, first that page was on third page of Google result, and now it is under 10. So I'm a bit confused that what was the exact reason? Was it traffic that matters, or uh, was it, uh, yeah, please. Yeah. Um... So, so both of those things, uh, ads and social sharing, are not things that we take into account for search. Uh, so my guess is it's either something, an, an indirect side effect of that, uh, or it's, it's just that our systems decided at some point that, oh, we should also index this page there. Uh, but uh, both, both the ads and the social sharing side are things that we don't take into account. Uh, traffic, in general, also not. Um, it's something where various SEOs externally have made tests with regards to traffic to see if, if traffic can get a page indexed, and that's not the case. So uh, from, from my point of view, probably it's just like it was almost indexed, and at some point our system said, oh, OK, we will actually index this page and show it in search. OK, so it was the hard work of our team. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah. All Thanks. right. Uh, Sure. Uh, Lena? Yeah, I'm happy that we got some time. Uh, so we have a news website uh, that, in addition to articles, publish a bunch of um, URLs with short updates, uh, so not much content. Uh, so I'm wondering if there's a best practice for news websites uh, to avoid thin content, uh, and if you would recommend to just no index all of these URLs with just the short stories. I, I mean, if you don't want them showing up in search, you can use no index. But I, I don't think you would need to no index something just because it's a short news article. Sometimes short articles are completely fine. Uh, so I, I wouldn't focus so much on, on the length of the article, but rather 
Like, do you do you want it indexed or not? Yeah, we would, but uh, I was just afraid that it will be um, viewed as short starts because it's just a paragraph, not nothing else. And yeah. yeah. Um, so so for web search, we we don't care about the length of the articles. I don't know if there's any any kind of policy thing around Google News. So especially if you mentioned that this is on a news website, um, I. I vaguely recall some, some errors that we had in Search Console way in the beginning where we would show this content, this news article is too long or too short. Maybe that's something that plays a role there with regards to news content. Uh, but if, if that is the case, you can also use the, the Google News, Google News meta tag to specifically block it from Google News uh, so that you can keep it shown in Search and just block it for Google News. OK, thank you. Sure. OK, um, let me just pause the recording here. I'll stick around a little bit longer for all of the, the questions that are still pending, and if anyone has anything else they, they want to share. Um, but thank, thanks for joining and uh, watching so long, if you're watching this as a recording. Um, and uh, thanks again for all of the questions that were submitted. And hopefully, I'll see you all again in one of the future Hangouts. Bye, everyone. Thanks, John.